obviously, over the last week uh, for the S&P was Trump going into hospital and get it, getting, uh, getting coronavirus, basically. Um, now, that, that has pretty much worked itself out pretty quickly, um, as there was news last night, you know, that he's gone back to the White House and the treatment seemed to have been successful and things like that. So the market recovered pretty quickly and pretty strongly on that news. Um, in terms of the kind of shape of the market correction and, and, and how we've been carving out this, this correction in market, I'm not 100% convinced that we're out of the woods yet. Um, you know, obviously Trump's health trajectory will still be need to be monitored, you know, until it's been two weeks since first symptoms, you don't really know, things could get worse again, whatever. I don't think that's the only driver of weakness in the market, um, but that's, that's obviously something to keep an eye on. I think the more important driver is basically this US fiscal deal um, not having been done yet. And you've got Pelosi and Mnuchin talking pretty regularly and market kind of anticipating that there might be hope of a deal getting done before the election. Um, I don't personally feel like there's a lot of political incentive for them to do that, certainly on the Democrat side. Um, so I think that's a risk. Um, that is definitely a risk that if that doesn't get done, that market could be disappointed. And, and because the election, we talked a little bit about last week, how even in early November, the election will probably not be decided as it normally would be. It's likely to be contested. It's likely to drag on into early December, maybe, maybe Thanksgiving, maybe early December, something like that. So if that uncertainty lingers on, that's probably not great for markets, right? So, so I think we need to probably at the margin, I, I think markets probably still remain a bit heavy because I don't expect a resolution on the fiscal deal. And I think the, the sort of election being contested is going to keep a bit of a lid on markets. So in terms of the S&P, I would watch this sort of 3,500 level, but not to break above that level. So we may fail, we may fail here around the sort of 34, 34, 30 area, like we did last time. But you know, provided we don't break that 3,500 area in S&P, I would still probably favor, we have a bit more room, a bit more work to do on the downside, okay? So that's on the S&P. Uh, the NASDAQ chart, similar story. Um, we had been kind of carving out this correction that I'd been labeling an ABC. I still think the C is yet to come. Um, and that could take us down towards target areas of 10,550 and, and maybe even 10,100 type area before it's complete. If we were to take out 11,800 on the upside, then I'd probably bail on that bearish scenario for, for, for the NASDAQ. Uh, and we may well then take another, another attempt at taking out the highs because, but I think to get above 11,800, we will need some, some impetus. We will need some sort of trigger for that, uh, which will probably have to come along the lines of the deal, the fiscal deal getting done basically. Okay. That's my view on USFTs. I mean, if, if we look a bit closer to home in the UK, obviously the pound, you've got <clears throat> the pound has had a bit of a rally off the lows uh it got to so it got to kind of 127 area um as boris was talking tough with the eu um but now we've had a bit of a relief rally because people are a bit more optimistic about a deal getting done um you've got stricter lockdowns potentially coming in the uk which is a bit worrying um obviously after what madrid i think madrid got shut down recently you know, so Europe's obviously having stricter lockdowns and in the UK, the numbers are looking pretty, pretty dire. So I wouldn't be surprised if by middle of October, we've got much stricter lockdowns in the UK. There, there, was, some, there was some things I saw yesterday about how, how the UK lockdown might look uh, and it sounded pretty scary, right? People literally not allowed to stay um, out of their home overnight. Um, you can only mix with immediate household members things like that. I mean, it, it's, it could get pretty crazy in terms of the restrictions in the UK. If that were to happen, obviously that's not good for UK growth, probably not good for the currency, might trigger um, the negative rates that the Bank of England are talking about playing around with. It might trigger some sort of response from the Bank of England, which would probably be negative for the pound. Yeah. So, so you've got two forces at play. You've got a Brexit deal, 
would we margin will obviously be positive for the pound, which could take us back through 132 maybe. Uh, but stricter lockdowns in the UK and no Brexit deal and maybe a hard Brexit looming obviously could take us back down to 125 or lower. Yeah. Me personally, I tend to run a structural short position in the pound. Um, I tried to press that position when it went through 128 last time, but I ran a tight trailing stop on that and got stopped out for like 50 pips. I've still got a short position. Um, I've also got a few puts that expire on the 15th, um, which, you know, don't have too much premium on them, but it's looking like they're not going to pay out. Um, and if we're going to get a load more weakness, it might be, a, it might be after that 15th deadline and we might see it towards the end of the month. Right. So, I'll kind of reevaluate and see if I want to add to any of my shorts if we do pop our heads up towards 132. But right now I'm kind of comfortable with what I've got on there. This is the big debate, right? What is the dollar going to do from here, right? The, what the dollar does, and that kind of means what the euro does, which is because it's kind of a mirror image, right? That is, that is the biggest question in macro right now because what the dollar does over the next two months is going to kind of determine what risk assets do, it seems, yeah? So if we get a load of stimulus, if we get a load of fiscal out of the US and they devalue and the dollar gets hit again, then we'll probably see risk assets rally. Uh, we'll see the euro go through 120 and the world will feel like a better place. If that doesn't happen and we get, you know, growth does roll over, um, dollar stays strong, uh, we'll see commodities sell off, we'll probably see equities sell off. And it will be a pretty horrible feeling Q4, basically, right? And may maybe COVID cases, could, we get we get a worse second wave than what the market is anticipating. That that could that could happen also, right? So I would say, I personally think the the debacle of the U.S. election and the fact that it's going to get contested and that we won't know the result. I think that's going to be dollar bearish at the margin, but I think there's a little window of the next two three weeks. Sort of before November, where the dollar might have one final push up. Yeah, so I think if you look at DXY, so you know, rejected this 94.7 area, which was pretty much exactly that level there. It's pulled back towards its kind of 20 day, 20 day average. Now, I suspect what's good, you know, we, we, we've kind of based around here. I suspect we're going to have a, another little push up in the dollar over the coming few weeks, right? Um, which may well be met with a bit of bearish price action in equities and, uh, and commodities. And then, then we may start to see the dollar pull back as the, as the U S election turns into a bit of a, a bit of a shit show basically. Yeah. So that, that was, that's kind of what I'm fancying for, for the dollar price action. Now, it will be interesting to see if that happens. Does does dollar weakness because of the U.S. election? Does that make risk assets rally? It may it may make risk assets outside of the U.S. rally. So you might see you know EM rally. You might see Europe have a bit of a rally. What what it means for the U.S. stock markets is unclear, right? To me, because if the U.S. is having a problem figuring out who the hell the president is, is that a reason why U.S. equities are going to rally hard? I'm not sure, right? So it's kind of funny one. I think you're gonna have two forces pushing the dollar. Fiscal coming through is gonna be weak for the dollar and good for risk assets, good for US risk assets. But a weak dollar on the back of a contested election and civil unrest in the US, that's not gonna be as great for US risk assets, but it might be okay for risk assets outside of the US and good for commodities as well, yeah? So, you, so I think that's that's one thing to kind of keep a close eye on and see see what happens there. But for the for the next two, three weeks, for me, the risk reward is probably to be bearish risk assets um, because it, it doesn't look like you've got clear, clear dollar weakness in the next two weeks that, and on the back of fiscal coming through before the election. And for me, that's the, that's the only reason we're going to get a real rally out of this market if fiscal comes through. And it feels like the political will is not there to get it done before the election to me. I might be wrong. But that, that's kind of how, how I'm, I'm sort of um, leaning right now. You know, the VIX, a lot of people look at the VIX and look at volatility as a bit of a gauge to feel whether or not the market can rally or not. It, it's a tricky situation with the VIX here. No, normally the VIX is high because, you know, markets are a bit more volatile and a bit more nervous and people are hedging risk and de-risking their books and stuff like that. 
here you've got the VIX actually quite elevated above 30 um, in, in terms of the front couple of futures, whereas realized vol in the US is only 20, 22. So that 10 vol point premium between realized vol and implied vol is because of the election, right? Because people are anticipating more vol going into the election, the VIX is trading a bit elevated, right? So whereas the VIX being elevated may have been a bit of an indicator of bearishness normally, I would say now because, because it's, it's more because of the election premium that the VIX is inflated. So that doesn't necessarily mean that we should sell off just because the VIX is looking high. Because I know there are a few market commentators who look at the VIX and say, oh, the VIX is a lead indicator and it's telling us the market's going to sell off. I think you've got to factor in the fact well, that VIX is only that elevated because of the election. Okay. Now, having said that, because the election is there and because the election is being priced to not be resolved quickly, yes, that, that in itself is a bit of a reason to be bearish because the, un the uncertainty of the election is going to linger on and the markets generally don't like uncertainty. Right? So, yeah, that might be a reason, but the, VIX, the elevated VIX in itself not so clear that that is a bearish indicator. The next thing I guess to talk about is gold. Um, so, I mean, gold's kind of, you know, had, had a decent correction, obviously, touched lows of about 18.50 and has bounced nicely off those lows. Has it, has it done enough to make me think the correction's completely over? Probably not. Um, so I still own some puts in gold um, for the end of November expiry. Uh, I still think there's a reasonable chance that I'll be able to get rid of those puts at a better level because I think there's still a there's still room as long as we don't sort of break this this 1960 area in short order then there's definitely room for gold to retest towards that 1830 or maybe even 1770 at a push um, and like I say if that was to happen that would probably coincide with a dollar rally right so if we do get a dollar rally and we get euro selling off a bit then yeah, we probably get gold selling off a bit as well, down to those levels. But longer term, love gold. Uh, take any dips in gold as a buying opportunity. I'm, I'm clearly very, very long still in my pension, but I'm just, at the moment, I'm just kind of tactically holding some puts because I think there is room for a bit of a test of these lower levels before it, it can then carry on with its longer term uptrend. Yeah, so that, that's kind of my thoughts on gold. Thanks so much for watching guys. If you enjoyed this video, then we'd love to have you join our Macro Insight community. Just visit www.options-insight.com and sign up for your free trial to our live and interactive weekly macro call. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll find more market updates, class highlights from our summer academy, and also video tutorials on anything from options basics, to market making fundamentals. You can also connect with me directly. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You can follow me on any of those platforms. Or alternatively, feel free to send an email to inquiries at options-insight.com. Thanks a lot.